for God I will to God I will the friends of darkness grim tremble not for him oh, his name is sure one little world shall fail that word above all earthly power no thanks to them abide the Spirit and the gifts are ours. Through Him do lift us either. Let goods and kindred grow. This mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. His kingdom is forever. Thank you guys for coming today. We, uh, you know, it's uh, a beautiful morning. I wore shorts because it's usually like 200 degrees up here. And uh, today I absolutely could have worn some long pants. So. It's good. It's good. But uh, we're going to have Amanda's going to read us a passage this morning from from uh, Philippians. It's going to be Philippians three seven through eleven. It says, but ever, what, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophet, to a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, not just me, praise forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels.
the suit it all, but the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, it shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, and in his name am I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. The God of glory, now just see. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Goodness, you can be seated. Sorry about that. Let's move these out of the way, see if that helps them all. This one's turned up. All right. Hey, listen, there's a reason why Jesus tells us that if you are weary, to come to him for his burden is uh, light and his load is not burdensome. And so this morning, we want to pray. We know that there are people that are in the midst of just maybe not storms, but just it's been a long six months dealing with all of the issues related to coronavirus, uh, waiting for uh, things in the economy to get back to where maybe they were before. Um, students <clears throat> who now have to know what day it is every day of the week because they got to remember when they go to school and when they don't go to school. And then what in the world do they do when it's, it's not their school day? Things are weird. And there is, um, there's tension, there's unsettledness, there's um, crazy phone calls. And I'll tell you this, we, we, we got our share of them here in the office, people who don't even live in our area that, that maybe don't have anyone in their area calling us to deal with situations that we really can't from a distance. Just know that things are crazy and uh, so grateful to know, uh, not just in a factual way, the Prince of Peace, but I pray this morning that you know in a personal way that when life is getting crazy for you, that the Prince of Peace reigns in your heart. So let's pray together this morning as we begin our service. Father, we do pray for those who are dealing with illnesses in this time. There's a, it's been said that when you, you start to get sick, you get a little bit older, that sometimes going to the doctor becomes a part-time job. We've got people in our own community that are dealing with that. We're, we're grateful to hear the news from Robin Bussey that <clears throat> she uh, does not have a reoccurrence of the throat cancer that has popped up so many different times over the last few years. We pray for Charlie Fail as he uh, begins the process of going regularly to the doctor for uh, radiation treatment for his cancer. Father, we ask for your strength. Uh, we, we do not fret like those who have no hope because we know you. Yet, yeah, Father, there are... <clears throat> other situations that we're facing that just have us vexed. We're dealing with so much tension in our com communities. We watch the news and we hear the news about the riots. Father, I pray that you never allow us to endorse foolishness and rebellion, but that the, the things, the racial tension that underlies us, that you give us a heart of compassion for people that aren't just like us, that you help us to love individuals, to stand up for for law and order and to, to back appropriate authorities, but an interpersonal level, Father, for us to just extend the love and grace of Christ wherever we may go, that we just don't lament and throw things at the TV, that, that we attempt to be the kind of people sharing the love of Christ that you would have us to be. Father, we do continue to pray for our first responders, police, firefighters, EMT. We pray for our students 
uh, who are getting used to a new uh, rigmarole of how life works. We pray for parents who are bearing all of this tension. And we are reminded that you tell us to come to you, to lay our burdens down at your feet, and to find rest for our weary souls. Father, we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, this morning we're starting a new sermon series in uh, the books of Samuel. If you don't know this, the history books in the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, First and Second uh, Kings, First and Second Chronicles, were one book called the Book of the Kingdoms. Uh, they they began to get collated into the Book of Samuel, the Book of Kings, the Book of Chronicles, and then as we started to add chapter and verse divisions to the Scriptures, we have what we find today: the Book of First Samuel or the Book of Second Samuel. And it's a very interesting time, uh, not unlike the times that we face today, whether it is interference from China or interference from Russia, as uh, the nation of Israel was in this uh, nascent state as a uh, relatively new entity. There were Philistines and Amalekites and Ammonites that were interfering with their daily life. They're in the midst of all kinds of rebellion. The book of Judges ends by saying there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Guys, that sounds like 2020 to me. They're in the midst of a huge transition from uh, living under the judges to in First Samuel transitioning to having a king. There's, if you want to use the terminology, a major national election coming up. And so in so many ways, while this book is, this book is 3,000 years old, the book of First Samuel, it sounds like it's come fresh off the press in 2020. And so here's, here's the question to kind of begin our, 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 our conversation this morning. Uh, a really important conversation about who will be king. But if, you're, if we use the analogy that your life was like a boat, your life is like a boat and you are on the ocean of life. Every single person's bow is pointed in some direction. You're heading somewhere. You have a goal that you're looking at. There's, there's a destination that you have in mind. Do you even know what that direction is? Do you know what you are aiming at? The truth is there are very few people who are truly rudderless in life, simply being cast to and fro by circumstance and wind and wave, simply being pushed around. You push too much, then some people just kind of squirt over here and go in a different direction. A lot of people operate with a very general sense of direction aimed at something. But to put this in another way, to figure out what you're aimed at, what is the thing that you are missing to have the good life? Well, what is the thing that you, if you just had it, if you pursued it and were able to overtake it, you would have the good life. Man, life would be so much easier if school was just back in all the way, jobs were restored, the election was over. There's all kinds of ways that we answer this question about having the good life. We, we answer this question financially. If I just had more money. Well, you know, the Bible has an interesting statement about that. He's saving you from yourself by keeping things simple. We, we answer the question, what, what is it that I'm pursuing? Maybe it's relational. Man, if my wife, my husband, my kids just loved me more, understood me better. We answer this question socially. Man, if I just had a, a friend who was a soulmate, if my friends were just more understanding. We answer this physically. Man, if I could just lose 20 pounds, life would be so much better. Could you have the good life without these things? If your finances weren't what you wanted them to be, could you have the good life? If your relationships weren't in your family, were not what they, you wanted them to be, could you have the good life? If your social connections were not what you wanted them to be, could you have the good life? If your physical condition was not what you wanted it to be, could you have the good life? I don't know if you're familiar with this, this author. He's a uh, author, inspirational speaker. He's been all over YouTube, and I don't even know how to say his last name appropriately because he is uh, he's Eastern European. His name is Nick Bujasek. Anybody recognize this fellow? He was born without arms and without legs. 
And as he became a teenager, he really struggled with meaning and purpose in life. If I can't, um, if I can't ever have a job, if I can't ever go to school, if I can't ever have a wife, if I can't ever do this, then why in the world is life worth living? And yet now he's an inspiration to millions, uh, writing books and speaking all over the place. He's married with at least one, if not two kids. And he is recognizing that all the things that he held out as holding life in them really did not. It was only through his relationship with Christ that life began to take on meaning. And so this morning, when we answer this question about why you're, where your life is pointed, because Jesus says some very, uh, very hard things about what should be first in our life and everything else is in a very distant second or third or fourth. So we'll be looking at 1 Samuel 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. And I invite you to join me in your copy of the scriptures if you're following along with your Bible app. And uh, we're going to kind of fix through the garden of First and Second Samuel, uh, First Samuel one and two, and uh, pick a few flowers that we think might be helpful for us as we learn how to live for Christ. First Samuel one verses one and two starts like this: There was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the hill country Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was. Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. We uh, are introduced to this family, and we're introduced to this place, Ramatham Zophim. Anybody know where Ramatham Zophim is in the uh, ancient Near East? Uh, yes, you do. You just don't recognize it by its Old Testament name. You would recognize it by its New Testament name of Arimathea. Arimathea, we know that name because of Jesus' crucifixion and uh, people who cared for Jesus in his death. This is that area. And so we're introduced to this uh, family that in the midst of a bleak situation, Judges 21-25, everybody is doing what is right in our own eyes, 1 Samuel 1. Now, let me tell you the story about a certain man. This man named Elkanah from Arimathea. And we know a couple things about him. The picture that we get of Elkanah throughout this uh, Throughout this first chapter is, is good. He has uh, wealth. How do we know that? He had two wives. You got to have wealth to have two wives. That's twice as many credit card bills, twice as many uh, mouths to feed. He has lots of kids. He has at least some uh, measure of moderate wealth. He has high standing, we'll find out. He's a very pious man. He leads his family religiously to do all the things that they are supposed to do. And uh, to make it even better, he's an affectionate husband. He cares. He may not be effective in his affection, but he is affectionate. Yet we find out something about this man that seems to be a community role model. He is a polygamist. He has two wives. And so the Bible is holding him up as a, a good role model, despite the fact that he has two wives, to show us how low morality had just generally fallen among the people of God. In verses 3 through 8, we're told something of this man's piety. He, he would go up uh, annually on, the, on a yearly basis to Shiloh, to the place where the tabernacle of God was, to offer sacrifices. Now, we're introduced to a ton of other characters in verses 3 through 8 that we'll talk about next week. Eli the priest, his, uh, his good-for-nothing sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And yet, as they would gather up to go, the, these uh, kind of facts that we find out about Elkanah's family, that Hannah had no children and Penina had a bunch. The yearly pilgrimage, the opportunity to go to worship, provided an opportunity for a most grievous persecution. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember when my kids were uh, younger, little ones, they would be angels all week long until it came time to get ready for church on Sunday morning. How does it happen like that? Or, you know, there's no serious conversations uh, to, to disagree about. And yet Sunday morning, you know, now we've got to figure out all these issues. And you, you hear the story of the people that they're kind of at it, just kind of uh, butting heads on the way to church and, and maybe not too kind. And then they get to church and they get out of the car and they see somebody like, oh, hey, brother, how are you? Totally faking. It's um, sometimes worship produces conflict. 
And here's where the conflict hit uh, most decidedly for Hannah. Uh, Hannah, uh, when the family decided to pack up from their remote location in the south part of Israel to go to Shiloh, it was pretty easy for Hannah to pack. We're already told that she doesn't have any kids. How long does it take you to pack for a weekend trip? There are a couple of clothes in the bag and you're ready to go. But Panina, we can almost imagine how the persecution would happen. She'd be like, oh my, oh my goodness, look at all these kids. How are we ever going to get ready just in time? Man, I, I can't even remember all their names. Hannah, don't you wish that you had kids? Hannah, you don't have kids. Why don't you come help me with mine? Because heaven knows you're already packed and ready. And whether it was intentional, and the, the text leads us to think that it was, it was this cloying Ninth dagger in the back consistently. And it, it, we're told every year that they would go to worship, there was this issue. Oh, Hannah, I'm so sorry, but since you don't have kids, God obviously wants you to help with mine. And she would just pass some of them off, highlighting this desire that Hannah had so much. Why were kids such a big deal? Well, it was different in their culture than it is in ours. Number one, they were an agrarian society, and so you need kids to help do the work on the, the farm to help make ends meet. Number two, there's no social security or 401k. So when you get old and you can't work anymore, guess who takes care of you? Your kids do. And Hannah has no one to care for her in her old age. Third, uh, just the survival of the nation. They had uh, invaded the promised land, and they were surrounded by enemies. And so bearing kids and building up the nation was something that was important. It's odd that Hannah's name means the favored one. And yet how can the favored one be afflicted with childlessness? There's a huge stigma here. And we're told specifically that she has a co-wife. That's a weird phrase. She has a co-wife that is a hater and a husband who is very well-intentioned and affectionate, but ineffective. She is dealing with bitter disappointment, and yet she reaches a turning point in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. As they are traveling to this place that is always the occasion for persecution on Hannah's part, she finally kind of reaches a breaking point and goes, maybe worshiping at the tabernacle is just the thing that I need. She doesn't know where else to turn. You know, her husband, Elkanah, always tries to give her a little something extra, the text says. In verses 3 through 8, he tries to give her a double portion of food to show that she has his heart, even if she doesn't have his kids, that she is precious to him. And yet, she, that's, that's not enough. There's an ache deep in her soul that will never be, uh, in her case, rectified unless God gives her children. And so in her grasping for relief, Hannah's story actually tells us something really helpful. Hannah's story shows us how we are to handle our troubles. You see, there's an interesting thing here. When we look at how Hannah handles our troubles, we find out that our hopelessness and our helplessness is never a barrier to God's work in life. As a matter of fact, you understanding your hopelessness and your helplessness may be the key to God's biggest blessings that come. As a matter of fact, I believe it's our total recognition, our recognition of our total inability that is the starting point for God to work. Uh, Hannah did not have the benefit of a bound book of scripture. But if she did, she would hear testimony after testimony from formerly, formerly barren women that have gone to raise up key leaders in Old Testament history. Whether it's Sarah with Isaac or Rebecca with Jacob or Manoah's wife who has Samson or in the New Testament, Elizabeth who bears John the Baptist. Our despair sometimes is the prelude to some of God's most incredible work. And yet going to God in prayer is so often not our first choice, but our last resort. The phone call that I got in the office this week uh, just heartbreaking in its content. But a woman who had rebelled against God for seven years, who now has kind of woken up and realized how far she is from God and does not know the first way to get back. You see, she thinks that as she's 
traveled down this pathway seven years running away, then now she needs to spend seven years kind of groveling to get back to the fork in the road where she made the wrong choice. And my words to her were, just repent. This is not an issue about what you do. You can't undo the decisions that you've made. Uh, you need to change your character. Ask the spirit to do this. But this is not dependent upon what you do. Allow your despair to, to make you cast yourself upon the Lord because that's when he works. Look at verses 9 and 10 in verses 12 through 16. This is after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the pitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Skip verse 11, go down to verse 12. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in all her heart, but only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be be a drunk woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord. I am a woman troubled with spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. She finds herself at the only place that can truly help the tabernacle. And she pours out her soul so fully to the Lord. I love just the absolute freedom that she has to say, God, things are not good for me. But as the priest observes her praying silently, weeping, her mouth moving, but no sounds coming out, he doesn't think she's pouring out her spirit. He thinks she's been pouring out something else. And he accuses her of drunkenness. So not only does Hannah have a really messed up home life, co-wife who's a hater, a husband who is affectionate and doting, and not really getting to the heart issue of what is affecting Hannah. So surely the priest at the tabernacle will understand my pain and my sorrow. And no, even the priest misunderstands her sadly. Evidently, prayer was so rare at the tabernacle that the priest doesn't even recognize it when he sees it. Yeah, that passage in Judges that everyone did what was right in their own eyes, everybody is in a bad way. And yet verse 11, that, that verse that we just skipped, is the content of Hannah's prayer, and it is the key to everything. Hannah likely prayed something like this many times before, and yet there's something different in verse 11. Verse 11 says this, and she vowed a vow. That's important when the Bible makes that repetition. She vowed a vow. She made the most ultimate commitment that she could possibly make, and she said, O oh, Lord of hosts. Now, this is interesting to note. You've heard, you've heard that phrase, Lord of hosts. We sing it in our songs. And yet, this is the first time that that phrase ever shows up in the entire Bible. It's not that Hannah coined the term. It probably was uh, used, God of armies, God of uh, angel armies, God of uh, majestic commander of the heavens. This is the first time it is used in the New Testament. Oh, Lord of hosts. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. He is showing us in this precious passage how to pray in a God-centered way. Now, I've mentioned this. Hannah's wanted a kid for years. Hannah's probably prayed a prayer something like this many times. And this is not formal prayer. You know, let's bow our, our knees and close our eyes and bow our heads and fold our hands. No, this is real talk. God, this is what's going on. I don't care what people think. I don't care that the priest thinks I'm drunk. God, this is what I'm asking for. And here's, in essence, what she says in verse 11. God, remember me, and I will give back every blessing you give to me. Remember me, and I'll give this son back to you that I want. And here's how she says that. She says, I will make him a Nazarite, basically, is what she's saying. I, I'm making a vow, and I will give him to the Lord, and no razor shall touch his head. Now, a Nazarite, what in the world is a Nazarite? That's an interesting phrase. 
There are several Nazarites that we see in the Bible. Samson, probably the most famous, followed secondly by Samuel, who was a Nazarite all the days of his life. John, that strange guy out in the wilderness, a Nazarite. Even the Apostle Paul himself took a Nazarite vow because most Nazarite vows were temporary. Whereas for Samuel, it will be perpetual. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. If you read through the passage, you'll find out that Elkanah was of the sons of Levi. He was from a priestly family already. So any fruit of the union between, between Elkanah and Anna would already be dedicated to the Lord. And so she doesn't need to dedicate him because he's already from a priestly family. And yet she says that she's going above and beyond to take a Nazarite vow for her son that would be perpetually concerned about holiness from his earliest days. So here's what you need to understand. She wanted a son. Now listen, we can go into the history of why a son versus a daughter. There uh, was, unfortunately, in a patriarchal society, more value placed on uh, patriarchal lineage and continuing on the family name. Uh, that's not bad in and of itself. But there were all kinds of cultural issues involved with wanting a son. A, a son and a daughter were both considered a blessing, but a son was considered a double blessing. A son gave you identity and standing and significance in the community. And again, because a son, especially a firstborn son, would be expected to care for you in your old age, there was a special sense of security that comes from having a son. And yet in this prayer, this son that she so desperately wants, this firstborn, uh, she, there's, no, there's no idea of a second or a third or a fourth one. Just, that she so desperately wants, she freely offers to give back to God. That means her son would not grow up in her house. Her son would not be available to provide emotional support. Her son, because he's committed to a priestly lineage, would have no land and no, no, no monetary significance. He would not be able to take care of her in her old age, but she specifically and methodically prayed for a son and then laid aside every benefit that he could, he could ever possibly be to her. In her heart, she reckoned, God, I want this son. But in the long run, it's better for him to serve God than it would ever be for him to serve me. I don't care whether you're actively parenting or whether that, that is something that you have kind of retired from. You may be sitting back and enjoying your grandkids or, man, how glorious to even enjoy perhaps your great-grandkids. And while Samuel's situation is different, he, he, Samuel is kind of a prophet, a priest, and a king, pre prefiguring Christ. Like, we can't take Hannah's situation and just plop it into 2020 and say, yeah, we need to be like him. No, she's in a, a specific, non-duplicatable time period. But isn't the content of her prayer what every single parent should pray? Not to me, but to you, O oh Lord, ascribe the glory. Don't, don't give me a family so that I can make much of myself. Help my family to make much of you. God, I am praying this prayer. Yes, it's for me, but it's not for me. It's ultimately for your glory. And how often do we take the benefits and the gifts that God gives and we cling to them? And we fight when someone, even God, tries to take them away. And we understand them as belonging to us, not belonging to God. And so she prays this incredibly self-crucifying prayer. God, I want this. But knowing you is the source of all these good things, I will freely, in an act of worship, give him back to you forever. Not mine anymore. And in verse 17, Eli, the priest, for the first time, and maybe only time in 1 Samuel, truly acting in God's place, pronounces a blessing on him. He says, uh, Eli answered, go in peace. And the God of Israel grants your petition that you have made to him. Verse 18, and she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went away, and she ate, and her face was no longer sad. 
This is a beautiful picture of an incredible change in demeanor that has happened. Eli pronounces a blessing upon her, and she takes that word from the priest as if it came from God's lips himself. And while nothing had changed in her circumstances, everything had changed in her attitude. Where the occasion to go and worship had, had, had brought on this tremendous persecution and this deep bitterness of soul. And even though she hadn't told her husband what she had done, we see this remarkable change of demeanor in verse 18. Her sorrow is gone. And instead of weeping and fasting, it says that she ate. That's usually a good sign for most people. If you're eating, you're good. You're healing. And what's, what's replaced this sorrow? The word that I would use is a humble joy. Humble. Not ostentatious. But this belief that God was actually going to do what the priest said. That he's going to shine his favor upon him. She had confidence that the Lord remembered her. And when God remembered, Hannah forgot her sorrow. I don't know what it is about our psychology. And this is not a y'all. I've been there too. You ever been down in the dumps and enjoyed it? Like, let me just complain about my life right now. Or, you know, heaven forbid, you try to complain because I can out complain you. Whatever your situation is, mine is worse. Why do we do that? Because every testimony that we give of how hard life is, is a testimony of how good God isn't. And we just need to get over our circumstances. Hannah forgot her trouble when she knew that God had remembered her. Friends, here's the question for you. When did God forget you in the first place? Never. When have things truly been out of control because they've been out of his hands? Never. God, even in the midst of your darkest days, God's still on the throne. He still ha you may not have this, but God certainly does. We see this heightened because in verse 19, it says that they, they got up the next morning. <clears throat> they got up the next morning, early in the morning, and they worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. Hannah's never worshiped. Every year that they made this pilgrimage and Panina would pick on her, she would be so uh, oppressed that she would weep through worship because she has to sit next to Penina and all her brats and just be reminded of all the things that she doesn't have. And yet in verse 19, there's no indication the sorrow that lifted in verse 18 is gone. And Hannah has the opportunity to truly worship for the first time in verse 19. It's a genuine day of worship for all, <clears throat> Hannah included. And friends, here's what I find so marvelous, marvelously glorious about this passage. Here's what we expect to see. Number one, Hannah prays. Number two, Hannah gets pregnant. Number three, Hannah is joyful. I pray. I get what I want. Now I have joy. Is that what we see? No, what we see is Hannah prayed. Hannah had joy. And then and only then did she get the thing that she requested of the Lord. How many of us are like kids on Christmas? Ah, my, my kids love the Harry Potter movies. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I prefer knights with laser swords, and they prefer owls and magicians. Who's the, who's the bratty kid that Harry Potter has to live with? The big guy. I can't think of his name. Anybody know his name? Is it Dudley? Dudley. Dudley has a birthday party, and he turns 16. And he counts his presents and he pitches a fit because he got more presents last year and he's not going to be happy unless he has more presents this year than he had last year. And I just think sometimes spiritually that that's the way that we are. That God's goodness in the past, we completely forget about it because that was last year. And God, if you gave me 16 blessings this year, if you don't give me 17 or 18 this year, you got a problem. You're holding out on me. And, and yet, despite the fact that nothing outwardly had changed, everything had changed in Hannah's heart. 
And her faith in God was strong enough that she could have joy, even though her dreams were still unfulfilled. And Hannah shows us that the deepest joy in life comes from relating to God, not from his benefits. The benefits are just that, benefits. Because if God doesn't give you what you want, why has he not? Maybe, maybe he knows that, that thing that you think would be such a blessing really will be a snare for your soul. And maybe he's saving you from yourself. If you only worship God for his benefits, then you don't truly worship God. And Hannah came to understand that. That the deepest joys in life would not be connecting to a son, but connecting to a God that cares. The end of chapter 1, <clears throat> in verses 21 through 28, we're briefly introduced to Samuel's childhood. Uh, again, it flash forwards to the next year. And Hannah says, you know what? I'm not going to go up to the tabernacle because I've got a baby and, uh, you know, we're feeding and taking care of him. Uh, but here's the deal, uh, Elkanah, you just need to know that as soon as Samuel is weaned, meaning she's not breastfeeding him anymore, it's my intention to go and leave. when I go up to the tabernacle again, there will be a really big tithe that I'm giving my son. And I'm going to leave him there. And he's no longer going to be a part of our family. So by the time he turns two or maybe three, it's time to fulfill her vow. And she takes this two or three-year-old boy and guess who she gives him to? Eli, the priest, that thought of her as the drunk woman. And she goes, remember me? Here's that thing that I prayed for. That thing that I want so much. And here I am standing good on my promise to give back to God that thing that I so desperately want. How easy would it be for you to put that in the plate? And I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know what your idol is. If it's significance or fortune or just comfort, how easy is it for, how easy is it for you to sacrifice this? And yet it's at this sad departure because we, we tend to think, oh, oh my goodness, poor Hannah. Poor Hannah. She's without a son again. And you would be so badly mistaken you wouldn't even know it. Because if you turn the page to chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Hannah bursts into a glorious and beautiful song, not about her son, but about her God. Listen to what it says. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 1, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, and my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly, and let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. She is overflowing in her praise to God, not to her son. She mentions God's name 21 times in these 11 brief verses, and she declares God to be holy, omnipotent, powerful, wise, and just. Why would you not praise him if he's all those things? She goes on in verses 4 through 8 to describe practical examples of his judgment and his care. The, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble, they bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven children, but she who had many children is forlorn. The Lord kills, and the Lord brings life. He brings down to Sheol, and he raises up. The Lord makes poor, and he makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and to inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. God reverses the circumstances of people who humbly trust in him. And she goes, me, 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 that's me. But I've still got more kids, but I've got more joy, and I'll take that trait every single day. I don't want the stuff of this world. She concludes in verses 9 and 10 with a prophecy. He, meaning God, will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. 
The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, and against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and listen, he says, and against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and listen, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. I have a king that is coming. And it's not Saul. That God has me. And it's not Saul. That God has a king that is coming that will execute perfect judgment. His reign will be one of incredible blessing. She knows that Christ is coming, though she might not refer to him. Application. We haven't gotten there quite yet. Let's try to make this application. We haven't gotten there quite yet. But why in the world did Israel want a king so badly? God was their king. And they said, no, no, no. We want a king like the other nations. Why did they want a king? For all the very same reasons that Hannah wanted a son. We want an identity. We want a leader that we can point to. Instead of God as some amorphous concept. We want significance. We want our king to have a big palace. And we want, we want to look important. We want security. And a king can rally the armies to fight us. All of the same issues, different in their application. But identity and significance and security, those are the reasons Israel wanted a king. And it's the same reasons that Hannah wanted a son. And here is the point. The security you most want, you and me, the security you most deeply long for, will never come through your kids or a king. I have a vested interest in who wins the next election. But regardless of who it is, God is still on the throne, and I have to humble myself to learn to live as a disciple no matter who the president of the United States is. Then give me an opportunity to have a bad attitude or, or, or do anything like that. Now, I, I have a vested interest. My salvation and my security is not found on who occupies Pennsylvania Avenue. My security and my significance comes from who occupies a vastly more important place than the White House occupies my heart. And the same is true for you this morning. You are trying to cram all kinds of things into your heart that have no opportunity but to ultimately disappoint you. Even if it is politics. Even if it is your family. You'll be disappointed if that's where you place your search for significance. But God's son, this king that Hannah mentions, incognito in verse 10, he can save to the uttermost. He doesn't just save temporarily. He saves forever. And he's here to tell us that most of our hurts and disappointments in life will come from not placing him first. There's a story that's told of another miraculous birth in Luke chapter 1. And here's the thing that's just so crazy. Strangely, Hannah is never heard from again after 1 Samuel chapter 2. Break out your Bible concordance, do a word search. You will not find Hannah anywhere else even referred to in the Bible. And yet when the angel appears to Mary... And tells her that she is about to bear the light of the world. The savior of mankind. You know what Mary does? She, this might sound vaguely familiar to you, bursts out in song. And guess what the basis for Mary's Magnificat is? 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Proof that there are never any little people. Hannah may not have rated enough to ever be mentioned anywhere else in the scriptures again. And yet when the most momentous moment comes and Mary finds that she is pregnant, even though she had never known a man, and she tries to find a way to put into words all of the incredible things that she is experiencing at that moment, she goes to a oft-overlooked woman, Old Testament character, 
And if you hold up Hannah's song right next to Mary's, there's a beautiful way that Hannah, forgotten humble Hannah, is remembered at the most important time. Her story proved to be a signpost to the Savior of the world. So here's the question for you this morning. Have you placed anything in the place that Christ alone deserves? I can't answer that question for you. What is that thing that you have made so significant that it's become a little g God in your life? What, what made Hannah's prayer different is I think Samuel was, uh, the prayer for Samuel was that until she got to chapter 1, verse 11. And she said, God, listen, not for me, but for you. In this story, and as the storyline develops, it was kids and kings. Maybe for you, it's finances or health. It's strange. We, we believe that God has our days numbered. And oh, how we pray for that to not be true when we get sick. How much better to pray that we just run whatever race God has for us faithfully instead of arbitrarily extending our days because we want to. It's hard questions. It could be finances and health. It could be politics or current events. It could be pride. These days, it could be prejudice. Whatever it is that occupies the throne of your heart, you have to surrender it. You have to let it go. Because it's sitting in someone's seat. And there's only one person who has the right, the authority, and deserves the glory and honor of sitting on the throne of your heart. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. To pray, pray with me, please. Father, today, we, we ask that you would just help us. We, we remember this from a long time ago, that you stand at the door of our heart and you knock. And you ask to come in, and we can remember with, uh, with great joy the day that we were saved. And yet, Father, it seems that every day, because you want to have a relationship with us, you knock at that door, and we assume because we opened it long ago that we can keep it shut now because we already know you. And yet, Father, we are such creative sinners that we shoo you out of the house and we put things in the place that really only you deserve. So today, what is good for us to remember is the way that we get right with you is the way that we stay right with you. We repent and we freely admit uh, those things that we have allowed to distract us. Father, today I ask that you help us to return to our first love. That you help us to recognize not just your benefits, but you. That you help us to learn these important lessons from Hannah. Hannah is a, ultimately not a significant character in the, the storyline of Scripture, and yet you use her in so many significant ways that, to even uh, crown Mary's song as a repetition of hers in the Old Testament. Father, may our lives be a hymn of praise to you as we ask you for the grace to surrender everything to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join me. Please stand and join me as we sing I Surrender.
Can you sing it without lying? Now, what a what a terrible question to ask at the end of a beautiful Sunday. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that isn't that what discipleship is? Is uh, asking the Spirit to reveal to us what we've not surrendered, and then in obedience to the Spirit's calling to say, "God, I lay it down," because you are better than anything I can hold on to. That's a great truth, and we are so grateful that you've joined us here this morning. Listen, man. What a beautiful morning. I, I, if the weather will stay like this, this is a good thing. I like this. And uh, we got to get a, get a few of you out of the sun here. Um, but other than that, it's good. Hey, listen, um, this week you should be receiving a mailing. Our offices are closed tomorrow for Labor Day. Uh, but very first thing Tuesday morning, we've got kind of a fall ministry going. Uh, basically, uh, we're laying out some special events that we've got that are coming up, some new scheduling that's happening. Uh, what's happening with our ministry to youth and kids. Uh, our youth and kids, I think, are pretty aware of that. Some new resources, especially for parents, uh, when it comes to doing discipleship in the home. Uh, we've already mentioned the hospitality challenge. And, uh, Chad, I think you get you get the, the points here this morning. I saw you going around talking to everybody. So um, remember that, guys. Listen, one of the things, while some of our ministries aren't meeting, maybe in this season God, God doesn't want our small groups meeting because – you need to be building relationships with new people. I mean, that's an awesome thing if we can do that. So think about this week, who you can encourage, who you can be hospitable to. And uh, if you have the comfortability of inviting someone into your home or, or uh, just connecting with somebody out, outside of the home, uh, that's a great thing. 
Um, last but certainly not least, one of the things that you'll see in there is a new thing that we'll be starting, oh, not next week, maybe two weeks from now, called Sunday Nights at the Park. Uh, we've been in conversation with Cherry Park about um, finding some ways. Churches say how much we want to be a big family, and then it seems like what we do as soon as you get on campus is we break up into different groups and you never see each other again. Oh, we're for families, but we're going to put your babies over here and your kids over here and your teens over here and the adults over here and the senior adults over here. So what we're going to do at Sunday Nights at the Park is going to be, goodness, I don't even know, uh, maybe a little bit like Vacation Bible School with family-style field games. Uh, and then an intentional time of fellowship at 6 p.m. where maybe we grill some hot dogs and ask you guys to bring potato salad or coleslaw. And we're going to do that every other week, Sunday nights at the park, 4 to 6, for some recreation as families. And uh, you don't have to play. You can just come out because there will be a lot more people sitting in a chair like that, Mr. Bigham, than there will be out there playing kickball with fifth, fifth graders. But we're a wonderful opportunity for us to gather together. And um, maybe that's your opportunity to extend hospitality to others. Maybe you come out and you sit with Charlie Fail and you find out what's going on in Charlie's life or you come out and you get to know Chad who's working hard at trying to get to know new people. And maybe you're not out there to play. Maybe you're out there to watch the kids have fun. And maybe you're out there to build relationships with other people. But you know what? We're so busy. We don't have a front porch experience. Anymore. And what we're trying Sunday nights at the park is give you an unhurried opportunity to be at the park for three or four hours on a Sunday afternoon and evening and just enjoy whatever fellowship uh, you can help build. And so you'll be getting that in the mail. There'll be a PDF that goes out about that. Uh, but what we want you to know is we think through what do we do after six months of being separated? How do we, how do we build back together what we were? It's not necessarily about going back to every single thing that we were doing. Maybe everybody being together in one big group and having the opportunity just to interact is the thing that God has for us right now. And so I'm excited for that. I think God is going to use that in some pretty amazing ways. And I tell you what, you'll have people that might show up at the park for a hot dog a lot faster than they would show up Sunday morning for worship. And if this becomes a cool opportunity for us to invite our friends and introduce our friends to our faith family, then glory to God for that. Guys, listen, we love you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.